The number one problem in our world is alienation, division, uh, rich and poor, black and white, Israel and Iran. Politics in the U.S. has never been more partisan. There are over 60 wars in the world. Six million people have died in the war in Sudan over the last 40 years. The Republic of South Sudan and the Republic of Sudan. Uh, the Sudanese army versus the Sudan People's Liberation Movement. Friendships fray at the slightest hint of discord. Families are struggling to live together. 65% of couples get divorced within the first five years of marriage. That's separation. That's alienation. The only solution to alienation is reconciliation. So how do you do it? We come up with the United Nations, NATO, marriage conferences. But you can't reconcile people without forgiveness. Forgiveness is the baseline of reconciliation. It's the key. Doug Coe, the uh, founder and leader of the fellowship for 60 years, uh, they're responsible for the national prayer breakfast in Washington, D.C. every year and prayer breakfast in all 50 states in our country and in most of the 196 countries in the world. Sat with the vice president of Croatia and his wife. This was back during the, uh, uh, the Serbian-Croatian conflict known as the Bosnian War. And as they sat down, the wife began to cry. She told about a friend of hers who uh, Serbians broke into their house. And they tied up her husband and had him watch as all four of these soldiers raped his wife. Then they tied her up and had her watch as they shot him. And then they made her watch as they butchered all four of her boys. Do you know that lady today goes around the country of Croatia telling people that they have to forgive? And she says the only way you can forgive is by Jesus. This woman has been a minister of reconciliation because she was willing to forgive. Was it hard? Of course it was. There's no reconciliation without forgiveness, and the key is Jesus. He's the only one who can change the human heart. If you can't change the heart, there can't be forgiveness. God has called all Christians to be ministers in the world. Well, what is the ministry? What's the purpose of our church? What is our vision? Uh, what are we trying to do? What is our win? The ministry is reconciliation. God has called us to reconcile people to God and people to each other. That's why our church exists. We're called to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And out of that love for God, the win for us is to reconcile people to God and people to each other. We're praying that through our efforts together this year, 30 new people will come to Christ and 15 will be baptized. 30 people will be reconciled with God. Counting all the adults Teenagers and children in our church, 16, 600 people call Portland Community Church their home. But I don't view that as the size of our church. Studies show that each of us have, have about eight people in our lives who don't know Christ. 
These could be people that work with us at our places of employment. They could be people we go to school with. They could be people on our sports teams. They could be pe members of our family. They could be neighbors. So our real church size is 4,800. That's our potential church. And out of that number, we're praying for 30 this year. That's less than 1%. Very doable. We're going to establish a welcome team. Michael will tell, tell you more about this, but a welcome team is basically kind of an expansion of our greeters. Our greeters meet people at the front door and at the name tag table. They hand out prayer dares. But we're going to train these people. Mike is going to do this. And uh, so we have people more intentional about looking for people they don't know and introducing themselves and connecting them with other people. We want to increase people in community groups from 151 to 170. But the way we're going to do that is we're going to start three new community groups. Uh, we want to start a, a young marriage community group, a group of uh, people in their 20s, and then two other community groups. And we want to increase the number of people in our discipleship groups from 60 to 100. We currently have 60 people. Some are meeting in pairs. Some are meeting in groups of four. And they study the Bible together, and uh, they pray for each other. Uh, we hope by the end of the year that these groups will, will grow, then they'll stop meeting, and then they'll meet with, they'll pick somebody else to meet with, and uh, will expand to uh, 100. All these people, as they grow in their faith, they recognize better that they're ministers of reconciliation. They're on mission with Jesus wherever they go, and they're trying to share Christ with people in their lives. So turn to our text today, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 to 21. It's on page 1160 in the Bibles under the seats. In 2 Corinthians, Paul tells about God's plan to reconcile the whole world to himself through Christ. And that he has called all of his people to be ministers of reconciliation. How can we reconcile people to God and people to each other. I find in Paul's words three things that give us confidence to live out the ministry of reconciliation. The first thing that gives us confidence to live out the ministry of reconciliation is the assurance that the gospel transforms lives. It would be difficult for you to go out and share Christ with other people if you weren't confident that Christ could transform lives. If, if people weren't any better off after you introduced them to Christ than before, it'd be difficult to share Christ with them. But Paul is convinced that Christ transforms lives. You know how he knows that? Christ transformed his life. In one of Paul's famous verses, the most well-known verse in 2 Corinthians, he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. He says, you're not the same person you were in your sorority or your fraternity. You're a new creature. And this transformation is not something we work up within ourselves. It's something that God does inside us. It's his strength working in us. Paul says, all this is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ. Three verses before, Paul writes, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died Prior to Christ stopping him on the road to Damascus, like the hatred that existed between Croatians and Serbians, Paul hated Christians. He wanted to do everything he could to stop the movement. What turned it around for Paul? He tells us, because we are convinced that one died for all. This is what caused him to reverse his opinion. Before he thought that Christ died on the cross, he, that he was accursed by God. 
and that Jesus had kind of fumbled things up and got in the crosshairs with the Roman authorities and the Jewish leaders and he got crucified on a cross. But when he was going to put uh, Christians in prison in Damascus and Jesus met him on the way and said, Saul, why are you persecuting him? Then he realized that Jesus really was alive and that he was really the son of God. And that he died on the cross for all people. And that included him. Christ dying on the cross for him is what turned it around for him. What does Paul mean when he writes, because we are convinced that one died for all, therefore all died. We can understand the part about one died for all, Christ died for all, but what does it mean, therefore all died? The next verse helps, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Paul says that when Christ died, it wasn't just Christ who died, but he wanted all people who give their lives to Christ to die to themselves. Self-centered living is a perversion of God's plan for us. We were never made to live for ourselves. Christ transforms us into people who live for others, who become ministers of reconciliation. One of the good news stories that came out of World War II was the story of a little 10-year-old uh, Jewish boy, Polish. Uh, the Nazis gathered up uh, hundreds of Jews and they had them dig a grave and then they shot them and they all fell into the grave. Well, somehow their shots missed this little boy and he fell into the grave with everybody else. Blood spattered on him and they covered him over with dirt. just a shallow grave so he could still breathe through the... And after uh, the troops had all left and it had got, gotten dark, he crawled his way out, out of the dirt and he walked down the street and he knocked on the first house at door and he told him his plight and the woman realized that he was one of the Jewish boys and she screamed for him to get out of there. And he went to the next house and same thing happened. House after house, he was rejected because people were afraid because of the Nazi troops. So he limped to still another house and a thought came to his mind. It seemed really odd for a Jewish boy, but after he, you know, he told them his plight, he said, don't you recognize me? I'm the Jesus that you say you love. And the woman looked at him and hesitated for a moment. Then she opened her arms and pulled him into her arms and they took care of him for the rest of his growing up years. Jesus says, whatever you do for one of the least of these, you do for me. Jesus transformed this woman into a person with love. Jesus comes into our lives and transforms us into ministers of reconciliation. And by the way, I want to thank you for your generosity to make our ministry of reconciliation possible. As you'll see uh, a little bit later, if you've already looked at our uh, uh, annual report, people gave very generously last year. Um, more people than ever before took, our, uh, took up our 90-day tithe challenge. Uh, if you haven't done that, you can just go to our website and go to the under giving to our 90-day uh, challenge. And many people in our church are taking up God's test. He says, test me in this and see if you give to me this tithe. I do not throw open the floodgates of heaven and throw out so much blessing that there will not be room enough for you to store it. If you go to our, if you sign up for our 90-day tithe challenge and at the end of 90 days you don't feel like God's sustaining you, he's providing for you and enabling you to pay all your bills, you can contact us and we'll give you all your money back. Many people have taken this challenge and say, I'm trusting God to give to him the first part of my income off the top before I do anything else. 
I want to increase my giving to the ministry of reconciliation in this church. You know, maybe you're not ready to give back to God the first tenth of your income, but maybe you would increase whatever you're giving like by one or, or two percent. Make that your tithe challenge. The second thing that gives us confidence to live out this ministry of reconciliation is the affirmation that God has entrusted to us, the ministry of reconciliation. Paul writes, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is unbelievable. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Why does God care so much about reconciliation? Because God loves every person he has created in this world. Paul is the only writer in the New Testament to use this word, reconciliation. Paul's a master at the Greek language. He has a rich and full vocabulary. He chooses a very special word here to describe reconciliation. The root word is aluso. It means to change. And here he adds a prefix to it. One of the wonderful things about the Greek language is that you can take words and add prefixes to them to make them very precise. That's one of the reasons Greek is the main source of language for all our scientific vocabularies, our medical vocabularies. Almost all scientific uh, vocabularies are made from Greek root words. So here he takes the, the Greek prefix kata, which means down, and puts it in front of aluso to make it kataluso. It literally means to change down from above. It's a change that happens downward. Modern science has adopted this word uh, to use uh, our uh, scientific word, catalyst. Catalyst is a chemical uh, agent that enters in with another chemical and makes a change, but it doesn't change its consistency. It's a very uh, sophisticated concept. What Paul is saying is that God comes into the world. He sends his son into the world and his son dies on the cross and takes all the sins of the world on himself, but he doesn't change. He remains pure. He remains holy. He's still the son of God. He reconciles us to himself. Every th time I think about the ministry of reconciliation, that God has given it to me, I'm blown away. Why would God take such an important task of reaching every human being in this world and give it to us? I find it highly motivating to know that God trusts me with this task. It motivates me to know that God is counting on me. And he's counting on you too. To tell other people about him. What's the best thing that happened to you over the last year? Did you tell anybody about it? Of course you did. Marketers say that on average, we tell three people when we're pleased with a new brand. We're just naturally wired to tell other people about something that we're pleased with. Actually, recent studies have put it even higher. On average, we tell 7.44 people. We all enjoy telling about good things that we've experienced. Over Christmas break, I played tennis with Tad, uh, Joel, and Cam. 
they know it's all about me. I set it up and dad wants to play and, and uh, it's just a thrill for me to be on the court with all of them. Uh, they all played tennis uh, on tennis scholarships in college. Tad played at the University of Idaho. Joel played at the University of Portland and Cam at the University of Montana. I'm the weak link. So we started playing and, it, and I grabbed Joel as my partner. He's the best. He's a tennis pro. And... Uh, and we started playing, and Cam and Tad were hitting them all to me, you know, and I'd dump it into the net, and i say, hey, guys, I, do you guys want to win, or do you guys want to play tennis? If you want to play tennis, hit it to Joel, because Joel, he doesn't just hit winners. He just kind of keeps it in play, makes the ra rallies longer, makes it fun for everybody. Well, we had a great time. I think they beat us, but it was close. And um, since then... A couple of my friends have asked me, how's your tennis game? And I said, oh, you know, over Christmas I played with Tad, Joel, and Cam. And they go, wow, that must have been fun. I said, yeah. We just love telling about fun things that we've done, don't we? If we're all wired to share good news, why do most of us find ourselves hesitant, insecure, or even resistant to talking about the only hope for the world, the greatest expression of love in the universe. Why are we afraid to say to people, hey, you should come to my church. You would love it. Either we don't think people will be receptive, and maybe they'll cut us off in our friendship, or we think it's not our responsibility. We think that's the job of the pastors. We're off the hook. The ministry of reconciliation is not an exclusive privilege reserved for clergy. Paul says he is committed to us. That's all of us. The message of reconciliation. He says he's given all believers the privilege of sharing the message of how people can experience reconciliation with God. Sure, some people have the gift of gab and are better at talking than others, but we all are given the ministry of reconciliation with people in our sphere of influence. We're all wired to share good news. Here's the ministry of reconciliation. Everyone tells somebody about someone who changes everything. You say, what if I blow it? What if I'm not up to the task? Am I really fit to be a minister for Christ of reconciliation? Second, uh, Paul asks in 2 Corinthians uh, 2, and who is equal to such a task? It's a rhetorical question. He means none of us are up to the task. Paul says, not that we are competent to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. We're not competent. We're not up to the ministry of reconciliation. But with God inside of us, the Holy Spirit, the God who created this universe, living inside of us, we are competent to be a minister of reconciliation to people in our family to people where we work, to people where we go to school, people on our teams, people in our neighborhoods. The third thing that gives us confidence to live out the ministry of reconciliation is the conviction that Christ's death covers all sin. Paul ends with another one of his famous lines. God made him, Christ, who had no sin, to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Why, why do some people hear the wonderful message of reconciliation, God to man? The wonderful message of God's forgiveness yet not receive it. What holds them back? In Joseph Conrad's Lord Jim, a young man 
goes to sea and a tragedy occurs with this 24-year-old officer. Uh, a naval trial ensues and he and his friends are convicted of cowardice. Well, Marlo meets uh, Jim in a restaurant and Jim tells him all about his story and what happened and how they got convicted and he tells him about his family. His dad's a pastor. He says, he's the best man I know in this world. And he said, my dad would never understand what I did. By now, my dad's read about this and he's crushed. And I can never go back to England. Because I couldn't explain it to my dad. He thinks he's dead he is too fragile to handle the news, so he never goes back. That's the tragedy of the book. Are you like him? Do you feel like, Jim, like you've gone too far and God can't forgive you? Do you think God would be crushed if he knew all the bad things you've done? Do you think God's sitting up in heaven and he's sitting next to Jesus and he's looking down and he says, oh my goodness, did you see that? That takes the cake. I thought I'd seen everything. God is not shocked by your sin. There is nothing you've done that will ever shock God. All the sins of the world were laid on Christ's shoulders he absorbed them all. God is not fragile. Don't imagine that you're so unique that you've done something so bad that God can't forgive it. God is able to forgive all sins and he laid all of them on his son. When Paul writes, God made him who had no sin to be sin, he has in mind the crucifixion. That grim afternoon when Christ was crucified on the cross. Remember when the, the whole sky grew dark? That was the sign of all the sins of the world being laid on his son. The sin that should have fallen on us, on lawbreakers, fell on the Holy Son of God. God made him to be sin for us. Knowing that Christ's sin, or, uh, that our sin is covered by Christ, all of our sins are covered by Christ, motivates us to live out the ministry of reconciliation because we know there's no sin anybody's committed that's not covered. When I was pastor of Sunset Presbyterian Church, we invited uh, Dan Allender to speak at our summer conference one summer. He's a Christian psychologist. He's really very funny. And he told about uh, when he was uh, speaking at a Bible conference in Montana. He took his wife and his 10-year-old son. And uh, Montana's kind of like the mecca for fly fishing in the world. And so he decided he wanted to try it. Never done it before. And so one night, after he was done speaking, he went out at dusk, had his float and all his gear, and, and uh, he went out, and it was just beautiful. The sun was setting, and it was just gorgeous, but he was surprised with all the birds flying around. They're flying around him, and, you know, he thought they'd be in bed by now, <laughs> but they're out, and they're flying toward him, and, and then he realized, those aren't birds. Those are bats. And he says, I hate bats. <laughs> and so all these bats are flying around him. So he starts taking his pole and he's trying to make a kind of a no-fly zone so they can't get around him. And, and he's going and going and, and he hits a bat. And he, said, he says to us, I'm sorry to admit this, but I got one and it went down in the water. And then the bat surfaced and started coming for him. So he just kept pounding on it and pounding on it. And he says, you know, I'm sorry to admit it, but one of God's creatures I caused to drown. Well, he just wanted to get out of the water. But as it would happen at that moment, 
he caught a fish. So at the end of his line and he starts pulling it in and, and he, he, he didn't care about the fish. He just wanted to get out of there. And, and up comes this fish, you know, this ugly, satanic looking gray fish. And all he wants to do is get rid of it. And so he's waving his, his, his pole around it to get rid of the fish. And he says, I'm sorry, he tells, tells us this. He says, I'm sorry to admit it, but it finally came off and it ripped its lips off. So he makes his way in and there's a guy sitting at the end of the dock and he, 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 he comes over and talks to him and he, he's, this guy's attending the conference. And he says, you know, I've been fishing for 50 years but I've never seen anything the likes of that. <laughs> well, Dan wanted to take his son, really wanted to go fly fishing, and so he took him out the next day after, after lunch, after he'd spoken from 1 to 3.30, and they didn't catch anything. He brings him the next day, they didn't catch anything. Next day, he didn't catch anything, and, and as they come in, he sees this guy on the end of the dock, and, and he calls him over again, and he says, uh, I see you've been bringing your son out fishing. Yeah. Have you caught anything? No. I see you've been coming out between 1 and 3.30. Yeah. He says, do you know that fish don't bite between 1 and 3.30? No. You want to catch a fish for your son? Take these lures and you bring him out tomorrow morning at 5.30. So the next day, they, he brings his son out, and they're fishing. They keep casting nothing. They're out there two hours. Now it's time to go. He has to speak, and he says, we got to go, son. He's really mad at God. God, can't you let my kid just catch one lousy fish? And his son Andrew says, Dad, can't I just cast one more time? He says, no, we got to go. And then his thought comes to him. He says, just because you've lost hope, you want to kill hope in your kid? So he says to his son, okay, you can cast, not just one time, you can cast five more times. Really, Dad? Yeah. So he casts one more time and nothing. Casts again, nothing. Cast a third time, nothing. Cast a fourth time, and Dan's just so mad at God. Are you really a 10-year-old kid? Then he casts a fifth time, and the magic happened. He caught this fish, and he's reeling it in. It takes a long time, and he pulls out this big northern pike. The kid's all excited, and then they start they start rowing in, and and uh, his son says to him, "Dad, we we serve a great God, don't we?" He says, "Yeah, we do." And he says, "You know, I know his name." And Dan's thinking, "My kid has never talked like this before." Yeah, what's his name? He's the God of the fifth cast. First cast, second cast, third cast, fourth cast. God of the fifth cast. God is still looking for people to be ministers of reconciliation who know we're inadequate, who know we're not spiritual enough, who know we're not holy enough, but we keep casting. We keep reaching out. We keep trying to reconcile people to God. There's so many people in Portland who don't know God. That's what our church is all about. That is our vision. So church, I'm asking you, will you go and be a minister of reconciliation to people in your home, in your neighborhood, in your apartment building, at your school, in your shop, in your office? What is our ministry? The ministry is reconciliation. God has called us to reconcile people to God and people to each other. 
We feel good about reconciling people to God and each other because we know that God transforms lives. We know that Christ makes a difference. It's worth it to tell people. We feel confident in being reconcilers because we believe God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. It seems hard to believe, but he has entrusted to us this ministry. We are his plan for reaching the world. And we don't hesitate about trying to reconcile anybody to God because we know that Christ's death covers all sin. Lord God, thank you that you have entrusted to us the ministry of reconciliation. What a privilege. We all know so many people in our families, in our schools, our workplaces, our neighborhoods that don't know you. And you want us to be reconcilers with them and help them come to know you. Give us a new vision for that today, this year. Who are the people in our lives that you want us to reach? You want to tell God that right now? If you've never committed your life to Christ, you can say, I want to be reconciled with you. Lord Jesus, I believe you died for all of my sins. Would you forgive my sins and come into my life? And if you've already given your life to Christ, say, God, I know I'm not up to the task, but I want to be a minister of reconciliation. People I know that don't know you. Maybe they've committed their lives to you, but they're not, they're not following you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.